as long as governments have made anything illegal, there has been a black market. And the very nature of that term is a product of the propaganda of said governments, of course, because the reality of the black market is that it's the less violent market in and of itself. We are sheltered from the violence of the white market, which is really the red market. You know, when governments make war and kill millions of people, they don't say, oh, that's that's violent economic activity. That's that's black market. When we buy guns from the military industrial complex and bombers and tanks and bullets, oh, that's that's white market. That's legitimate. That's right. When we point guns at you to collect taxes, that's white market. When you go and buy something at Walmart, and if Walmart doesn't give the government a piece of the money that you just gave to them, that they're going to be shut down by the threat of force from government. That's that's the white. No, that's the red market. If anything, the black market is the peaceful market. Why do we associate violence with the black market? Because government causes it all of the violence around the black market is a product of the government imposing secrecy making it harder for those of us who want to transact in a world without that violence in a world of peaceful commerce and that's why this violence happens now the crisis that we are in today the coronaphobia crisis is not a crisis due to a pandemic again not to say that the pandemic isn't a thing. There is a pandemic, a very real health crisis. Remember H1N1 and swine flu and all and Ebola, all these other modern health crises that did not turn into the feeding frenzy of fear and government that we have today in this coronaphobia pandemic. What we have today is not a health crisis. Yes, there is a pandemic, but that is not the crisis. The crisis that we are experiencing today is the forced unemployment crisis. And just when government makes something illegal that people want to consume, they will find a way. People want jobs. People want to earn a living. Imagine that. We want to help our fellow human beings in order to be rewarded for our efforts, to be able to be productive, happy, healthy members of society. And yet government has come in and said, oh, you know how mil tens of millions of you were working in jobs where you had to, to, to talk to people face to face? You had, you had to serve them food and drinks and things. Well, guess what? Your jobs don't exist anymore. Fuck you. Just nope, wiped out. Not allowed. You are not allowed. And if you use your freedom to pursue your own economic interests here, what's going to happen? The violence of government will be used against you. And this is no longer as if it ever was, some big abstract thing. And libertarians talk about this a lot. We say, yes, government uses the threat of force to control our behavior, taxation instead, because it's backed up with violence. And most Americans go, we don't have armed IRS SWAT teams roaming our neighborhoods to collect taxes. Where's the violence, Adam? That's silly. Well, as always, we can explain. It's not hard to point this out. Don't pay your taxes, see what happens. And therein comes the violence. And just a little bit of violence is enough to scare everybody else. And so for most people, the threat of violence behind the theft that is taxation remains this abstract concept where the violence is so, yeah, I, I heard about that guy who went to jail for tax evasion. That's too, And we're generally sympathetic to that because we know IRS stands for it really sucks as in sucks the life out of you, sucks the life out of an economy, sucks the life out of any business or, or individual who's been audited or faced criminal charges for not giving in to the theft of taxation. But when I say the violence of the forced unemployment crisis is in our faces, I mean in a very real way, undeniably now, with the cases we brought to you from Texas <clears throat> last week of the salon owner of the bar owner, of the gym owner in Florida. No, that was in Texas too. Got to hand it to Texas is really a split personality kind of state, aren't they? Because they had some of the worst lockdowns. The great Republic of Texas has not just a weird police state authoritarian streak to it, which it does in, in a very, very dangerous way, which I have encountered myself 
a number of times. But also, it's not like Texas believes in small government as a state or as a collective. No, the, the Texas state government is, I mean, it's not as it's not as bloated as California, but that's setting the bar pretty darn low, isn't it? <laughs> I'm I'm not morbidly obese. I'm just obese. I'm I'm not California corrupt. I'm just Texas corrupt. <laughs> okay. And now what we are seeing is a true bifurcation of the economy, a real splitting into what is coming to be soon roughly even parts. And, you know, by some uh, economic analysis, we might say that it's it's already a bifurcated economy. It, and, and I endorse a broader understanding of economics as inclusive of things that aren't just measured in dollars and cents and widgets and other things that can be accounted for on the bottom line. But it, just because I believe in agorism, right? Conducting your economic affairs off the record, not contributing materially to the evil of government as much as possible, avoiding paying taxes by doing barter, doing your business uh, off the record, under the table, anything that you can do to avoid materially supporting government. Yes, I 100% support that. But you just look at barter. As, as an example, it says, you know, hey, we have to look at the economy as a bigger concept than just the red market metrics that they would have you believe are how we measure our economic health. There's so much happening in the world that will never be counted in dollars. Relationships that are great exchanges of time and energy and love and experience and wisdom. Those are not reckoned in dollars and cents, but counted in quality of life for those of us who appreciate those things. So in a sense, I might say we already have a bifurcated economy. If you include everything of economic value, most of what we experience, most of the value in the world that's relevant to us as individuals is not going to appear on any corporate balance sheet ever. But even with what we see today by the metrics of the red market, and I think red is really a more appropriate term because when we talk about a system of economics that is is really uh, you know based in in violence, it, it's also it's a form of collective violence. You know, communism better red than dead, right? Well, no, the red will kill you, and now we have. But well, we have people dying. The cure is worse than the disease. If, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. If your only solution to big ideas or big, big challenges facing humanity is government, then you're going to go about things that deserve nonviolent solutions with violent ones. And you are going to make things worse, as we see today in this forced unemployment crisis, where very soon, the reckoning of the numbers will be clear that more people will die as a result of the economic interventions by government than from the virus itself. Even all that being said, the red market, the commun, it is communist. It is really, you know, the basic premise of communism from each according to their ability to each according to their need. A beautiful idea of, of sharing when, when, when considered voluntarily, certainly of a, a compelling emotional, if not logical argument here when you say, therefore, we are going to take from you with a socially endorsed collective institution of violence as government is. So yeah, I think calling it the, I'm not going to call it the white market anymore. It's the red market. I wish I could call the black market the white market, but no one would know what I was talking about. Those are the white market and the red market using it that, that way. But in terms of all of the material things that we are more keen to in the white market analysis, even by that, the white market is contracting. In there, they, them, those who won't just leave us alone, in their efforts to consolidate economic power around this coronaphobia crisis, I've, I've said this before, they, they've gone too far, but that's that's not it. Okay. The people who are profiting off of this crisis are going to get away rich. 
they're going to be able to take their money and, and get their private sex islands and, and, and they'll be fine. But in terms of the system itself, yeah, the people who want to keep the system going forever, they went too far. When you make it illegal to work, when, when work is outlawed, only outlaws will be employed. <laughs> <laughs> took me took me a second to put that together you all know when guns are outlawed only outlaws will have guns this this old talking point used by the pro-gun right well when uh when freedom is outlawed only outlaws will have freedom i guess we're outlaws here at the garden the garden of freedom here in arizona so the, there are some economic stories here that I, I want to tie into this to back up my case to show you just how much the black market is exploding and that even in the traditional metrics now it is clearly leading us towards a true bifurcation of the economy where the black market is is going to come to rival the significance or the size of the white market from dnyuz.com Manhattan faces a reckoning if working from home becomes the norm. Before the coronavirus crisis, and I, I even even here, I'm like, okay, you can you can call it the. There's so many. I, when I read the news now, the lies are just more obvious than ever before, and in in the basic misrepresentation of the truth, because we know we know. The coronavirus did not cause the shutdown. The coronavirus did not cause your economic hardship. Government did that. I'm not a grammar Nazi. I am a definition Nazi, though. If we want to accurately understand and relate to reality, we must use accurate language to describe it. Before the crisis, three of New York City's largest commercial tenants, Barclays, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Morgan Stanley, had tens of thousands of workers in towers across Manhattan. Now, as the city wrestles with when and how to reopen, executives at all three firms have decided that it is highly unlikely that all their workers will ever return to those buildings. The research firm Nielsen had arrived at a similar conclusion even after the crisis has passed. It's 3,000 workers and the city will no longer need to be in the office full time and it can instead work from home most of the week. Now, I, I want to step back for a second and examine what we had as the pre-crisis state of affairs compared to now the mid-crisis state of affairs and what, what that contrast has illuminated, right? So if all of these people who worked in these fancy office buildings in Manhattan before the crisis were able to work from home but weren't working from home why were they doing that if that represented such an economic inefficiency in and of itself there must have been some reason praxeology the understanding of human incentives and behavior based on those incentives tells us there must have been some other value calculation or misunderstanding that led to this inefficiency now before the crisis did people in manhattan really go well gee i've never heard of this working from home thing what well, what is this wow this is new oh coronavirus is here oh and we have the internet i had never heard of it. what's the internet oh my gosh i can work from home now no obviously that's not how this happened this is not a new awareness. This is not a new uh, technology that we're employing here in order to work from home. This is something we've had the whole time. What has changed? What is the actual change? Because now we, it's like, we, you could say we discover, oh my gosh, thanks to coronavirus and the pressures to, to work from home to maintain physical distancing, we've discovered this new idea of telecommuting and now we're gonna apply it. And isn't this great, great silver lining? We've got, no, obviously that is not what happened. Now we could say, hey, there was, there was a reason for them to be working in person in, in these huge office buildings, expensive, 
high maintenance. These aren't cheap. You know, what does it cost these companies to gather their employees up into these skyscrapers and say, you're going to work here instead of working from home or instead of working in a more distributed way, a more dispersed way, right? And this is something that I'm personally very uh, enthusiastic about, that there is a shift towards decentralization or at least a trend away from the illegitimate economic. Why, why do so many people live in New York City? Why do people live packed into cities the way they do today without the Federal Reserve System, without this fountain of money going mostly to people physically close to it? And of course, this is why you have cities in every state that are major blown up capital cities with federal funds because you have two senators and they can bring back their share of the pork barrel disproportionate to your population. But why do we have this incentive to live asshole to belly button in giant piles of people in these huge cities? It's an economic distortion. What has changed in the age of coronaphobia is not that fundamental economic reality, but rather the incentives and the benefits of the inefficiency. Think about this for a second. There's a certain amount of prestige that goes along with working in a skyscraper, in a tall building that allows you to look down on the rest of the city, having an, an office in a capital, a city on the hill, all of these things that in the past provided the economic incentive for these companies to have in-person offices when they didn't need them. Now the fear is what has changed the economic calculation. And what people are realizing is not that there's a new technology, but that the application of it and the efficiency that you gain from it, first, oh, well, I need to apply it because this is going to keep me safe from the coronavirus. I get to stay and work from home. I only have to go out to the grocery store and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spray down all my vegetables with, it, with hand sanitizer and bleach before I, and I'm going to leave them outside. So they're, you know, for three days before I bring anything inside, I'm going to have a sterile bubble. And like, okay, well, now you go, and then, and then the fear fades and you go, well, this is still better. Why, why would I commute in this weird backwards race of rush hour traffic to see who can get to their shitty jobs the fastest? Why would I do that? This is not just an economic realignment. There is a value adjustment that goes along with this is people realize that the prestige and 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 the image and really it's it's a big part of this is the image right if you're a company where everybody could work from home and they would be just as effective but you can pay them more you can pay for a building a skyscraper with your name across the side and you don't just get the advertising value you get the prestige of that your company is more respect. Well, now your company's not respected in the public eye because the public wants everybody to be safe working from home. That's the economic calculation that has changed for these big companies. And we're going to see a huge adjustment. This is, this is a positive thing. This is a rediscovering of what really matters or a, an adjustment of economic behavior and calculations to reflect what really matters. A lot of this is the low, I, I should say, deficiencies in conscious consumerism in the United States, that a company that does that kind of shit gets more value out. They didn't do this because it was at a loss for them. Before the fear, this was a profitable exercise for them, practice of theirs. Now it's not. And accidentally, it would seem, the market has improved. Now we go to sfgate.com, another important part of the process of bifurcating the economy and why it's so essential that we apply localization rather than fighting over the centralized system in order to extricate ourselves from this dilemma. Accusations of socialism have lost their bite. Recently, Joe Biden declared that any future stimulus would need to be a hell of a lot bigger than the $2 trillion CARES Act. He isn't alone. On Tuesday, House Democrats proposed a coronavirus rescue bill that would appropriate more than $3 trillion for health agencies, state and local governments, an extension of unemployment benefits, and a second round of stimulus checks to Americans, among other components. 
Other prominent Democrats are pushing for even more, like monthly $2,000 payments. Now, we covered that story when that came up last week as a possibility coming out of Congress. Still a distinct possibility. The collapsitarian in me hopes that it passes because I know that if they start doing this, you're, this is going to be the primary motivator of the bifurcation of the economy when individual incentives have so shifted. And just to remind people the proposals that if you're making $120,000 or less a year, you would get paid $2,000 a month for yourself, $2,000 a month for your spouse, and $2,000 a month for each of up to three children. That's five times $2,000. That's $10,000. That comes out to $120,000 a year. Why would anybody work when the options work hard, make $120,000 a year, get taxed, even directly 30 plus percent, 20 to 30 ish percent if you, if you do your tax as well, if you claim all your possible deductions, whatever. In order to subsidize someone sitting next to you working nothing and still getting $10,000 a month, this would lead to rampant, unemployment, un, uh, rampant in, inflation and, of course, rampant unemployment in the red market in the, the excuse me red market without quotes as i'm calling it with quotes white market why would you have a white market job if that reduces your ability to make money why why would you do that you can have a black market job <coughs> take your ten thousand dollars a month in profit and all right we're going to interrupt for a super chat here before we get to any more of these stories this is a long opener R-H-S-T-J, $4.20, freedom. I think that's a request, right? Any For, for a yeah. symbolic toke on the air. I, I maybe, maybe I need to slow down. This is a long segment, but it's an important one. We're going to go the full half of the show because I got more stories in explaining what's happening with this bifurcated economy. For $4.20, we, we will interrupt Adam versus the man. I'm a cheap date. Thank you very much, R-H-S-C-T-J. All right, we interrupt your regularly scheduled deprogramming to get back to the news. This story about socialism having lost its bite as a label goes and gives Bernie Sanders credit for his historic run in the Democratic Party primary. And, and I, I, I mean, like I give credit where it's due in the sense that, yes, Bernie did accomplish a lot and getting the term Democratic Socialist out there. But what's really it's, it's exciting about this is that Bernie said, hey, I'm a democratic socialist because, you know, I believe in in uh, free retirement. Uh, I believe in in free college education. Uh, I believe in an increased welfare state. Well, guess what? The Republicans in power believe in all those same policies, social security, socialized defense, socialized medicine, uh, the, the, the VA, Medicare, Medicaid. They're not opposing these. Uh, well, oh, well, Adam, we we Republicans in Congress, we actually believe in them, but we're fighting the Democrats. So you better give us more money for our reelection. So that we can fight the Democrats because, you know, with socialism light is better than socialism heavy. Really? Bullshit. So the idea, the fact that the accusations of socialism have lost their bite, I, I think that's true. Yeah, you, you're a socialist. Yes, I believe in this kind of economic system. It's, it's kind of a mainstream thing. And as libertarians, they say, no, you can't. Let's pull the rug out from underneath people. This is tor- terrible. Let's get rid of this whole system. Yeah, it's tempting to say that, but again, localization is a much more compassionate way for us to ease our way out of this and transition these socialist systems that we have become dependent on into voluntary systems. That's the goal of libertarianism. A world set free in our lifetime is not a world without government. It is a voluntary world where your rights and your freedom is respected. For the Associated Press, APnews.com, Powell warns of possible sustained recession from pandemic. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell warned warned Wednesday of the threat of a prolonged recession resulting from the viral outbreak and urged Congress and the White House to act further to prevent long lasting economic damage. Again, is the recession from the pandemic? No, that's a lie. Now is the story a lie or is the guy in the story lying? Well, he is the Federal Reserve Chairman. I, I assume that he's a very, very dishonest person. 
the Fed and Congress have taken far reach. Now, by the way, I don't mean necessarily to impugn his personal character. I just mean in what he is doing in order to sustain the system of fiat currency that is used to rip off the American people. There's no way he can deny it. You want to argue this? You want to let him? Well, I'm an honest person in my personal life. You never caught me in a lie. No, but you are lying to yourself. You are lying to the American people. You are supporting an illegal, immoral system that is fundamentally dishonest, the Federal Reserve System, the whole fiat currency U.S. dollar system. And the bottom line is no matter what arguments you want to use, say, well, I don't the system. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and you are sustaining the system. You are responsible. That is dishonest. So the Fed and Congress have taken far-reaching steps to counter what is likely to be a severe downturn resulting from the widespread shutdown of the U.S. economy. Now, at least here, the Associated Press is being honest, saying that the downturn is from shutting down the economy, not because of the virus. Like if people, now, now there is, if, if there was no government response, no forced economic shutdown beyond what would be chosen by free individuals, you could say that there might be a minor economic downturn resulting from the virus. If the government numbers are true, and we know they're not, another story about the White House now finally battling over the death count. But they, by the worst, was it what, 2,000 a day in the United States, 3,000 they were, they were predicting, you know, and, and realistically, what, what that's going to come down to, we know, probably a fraction of that. But let, let's say that you, you have an average of, of a thousand people, a thousand Americans dying a day for six months. Tragedy. It's 180,000 Americans. Significant. You know, one death is a tragedy. A, a million is a statistic. Well, no, this is a statistic that represents 180,000 tragedies if this is the case. Again, perspective is absolutely essential here. And I, and I asked, and we had a presidential debate just this past week, and I asked one of my fellow candidates, not going to put him on blast here, but because he was going into this corona fear narrative, I said, do you know how many Americans die on a daily basis? Guess what? He didn't know. Yeah, thank you, Jim. No, he didn't know. He didn't know. This is not, and, and if they can misdirect your attention of all of the tragedies in the world, they say, focus on this tragedy, give us more power. All you need to escape that is a little perspective so that when they come at you and go, look at this tragedy, you go, yeah, that's a tragedy. What are you going to do about 40,000 Americans dying every day on government roads? What are you going to do about 22 veterans committing suicide a day? What are you going to do about obesity, heart attacks, all the chronic conditions that, that Americans die from? What are you doing about that? Because if you say, let's pay attention to this crisis, it shows that you don't care about humanity. You are not saying pay attention to this crisis because this is a crisis that I care about and people are suffering and I care about human suffering. You're saying pay attention to this crisis because it's going to make me money and it's going to cost you and I'm going to get to fuck everyone over if you pay attention to this tragedy and you ignore all the other tragedies. So Howell says, quote, we ought to do what we can avoid these outcomes. He said additional rescue aid from government spending or tax policies, though costly, would be Worth it if it helps avoid long-term economic damage and leaves us with a stronger recovery. Now, if he was honest, as someone who I am going to assume understands economics, he would say, we need to do something about this forced unemployment crisis. But, again, the bifurcation of the economy. A lot of this is now happening in the age of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. The fact that all of these people going, you know what, $120,000 a year, I can't make that in your white market. Give me my $120,000 welfare and I'll go work under the table. And if you try to catch me and punish me, for not following your rules or reporting money that I've earned in tax or earned in, in US dollars, I'm gonna start working for Bitcoin instead. Why would I use money that I can get in trouble for using when I can use this thing that in some ways government has declared is not even money? <laughs> it works like money for me, that's good enough. And by the way, it's a currency that is engineered to gain value over time rather than lose value over time. 
which currency are you going to want to use anyway? I suspect what we're going to see if this goes through, if we see a world where families can claim $120,000 of welfare a year cash just for not working, why would they even keep that intact? Like, I mean, I'm going to do this. I'm married now. I'm going like, shit, can I adopt three kids so that I can get another $6,000 a month? Right. But no, I'm going to do this. And I, I, and everybody should take advantage of government as in take as much money from them as you can, because it's less money that they have left over to hurt innocent people with. It is a right. If you can take money from government without causing them to take more from others, do it. What am I going to do with those checks if I don't spend that money right away? And this, this is where we, we hit a tipping point in the inflationary death spiral. When you get U.S. dollars, when the average American is handed U.S. dollars by government, by their employers, by a business, and they go, well, if I sit on this for even a week, it's either it's going to lose a percent of its value, when Bitcoin is going to gain value during that time. Let's just say it's let this simple math. Let's say it's $1,000 a month and the dollar is going down by 1% of value or purchasing power value every month and Bitcoin is going up by 1%. Well, if you switch your dollars into Bitcoin right away, that $1,000, you're saving the $10 that you would have lost and you're gaining the $10 that you would have gained or that you will gain from the Bitcoin. That's a $20 difference. Now, if you're faced with that challenge, you go, well, is it worth is it worth the effort to learn about Bitcoin to even do this one transaction to maybe pay a, a, a commission on it? Maybe not. But what if that's a $20 difference? This is a 2% difference in your wealth with this one little chore. But what if what if the dollar starts going down by 2% a month and Bitcoin is going up by 2% a month? Now you're talking about $40. I'll do a chore for $40. I'll pay a $10 trade commission if I know I'm going to make $40 off it. But that actually radically underestimates the value increase proposition that we get from cryptocurrency and from Bitcoin. 1% return per month is actually pretty, pretty darn low by Bitcoin standards. When we hit that tipping point where the average American goes, well, gee, the, the differential value of holding dollars versus holding crypto justifies making some significant transition, you're going to go, nope, time to get out of the dollar. That's what is going to motivate this full bifurcation of the economy. Back to APnews.com, built for a global economy, Dubai now threatened by virus. From the United Arab Emirates, Dubai built a city of skyscrapers and artificial archipelagos on the promise of globalization, creating itself as a vital hub for the free movement of trade, people, and money worldwide, all things that have been disrupted by the coronavirus pandemic. Now with events canceled, flights grounded, and investment halted, this shakedom in the United Arab Emirates is threatened both by the virus and a growing economic crisis. Under pressure even before the outbreak, Dubai and its vast web of state-linked industries faced billions of dollars in looming debt repayments. Congratulations, we are no longer as a global family supporting rich assholes building skyscrapers and palaces at the expense of everyone else. We are no, okay. Maybe that's an exaggeration. Uh -huh. We're not there yet, but this is where we're going. This is exciting. This is a positive development. This whole, and, and I've praised what's happening in Dubai as an economic freedom zone, but it was an economic freedom castle built on a foundation of sand, literally. But economically, even metaphorically, no, the foundations of this economic exercise were, were not solid based on government distortion and the effect of those distortions in many ways, is now failing. Speaking of which, going to yahoo.com. As Italians wait for cash, banks and government blame each other. Wow. Really? Don't you love to see 
the dragon that was about to kill you eating its own tail instead? Italian businesses struggling to survive the coronavirus crisis need cash now. What they're getting instead is finger pointing as the government and banks blame each other for the slow delivery of desperately needed economic relief. And so, like, you know, all these arguments in the United States, even even like we heard from Justin Amash, uh, said, we, we need more relief from government. We need 2000 and, and Amash said, yes, more relief from government. We need regularly monthly checks. Do you really think government is capable of that? <laughs> Look how bad the welfare system is rife with fraud, waste, and abuse from top to bottom. And this is the system that we just have laying around that we get to work on and improve all the time. Now you want a new one, a new program out of the blue that we were going to rush to market and expect that there's not going to be a whole other scale of fraud, waste, and abuse that would outweigh any of the possible benefits from this. Two months after the government, this is Italy, promised to unlock as much as 740 billion euros, $800 billion to mitigate the economic damage. Just a fraction of that sum has been received by firms and families. Mm -mm -mm. You think the United States government is going to be any better? Of some 300,000 companies that asked for emergency unemployment benefits, less than one in 10 has received them. Just six large companies have been granted a state-backed loan as of May 12, according to the Bank of Italy. Gee, I wonder if those six large companies had good relationships with government. Surprise, surprise. Now, we see a different kind of bifurcation happening in China from AFP by uh, Yahoo.com. Green or red light China virus app is ticket to everywhere. From Beijing to enter many offices, restaurants, parks, or malls in China nowadays, people must show their status on an app that determines whether they are a coronavirus threat. There is often a moment of tension before opening the app on arriving at a location. A green light lets you in anywhere. A yellow light could send you into home confinement. The dreaded red light throws a person into a strict two-week quarantine at a hotel. Such controversial use of technology has raised alarm in Europe's countries, including Britain, France, and Switzerland, looking to launching their own apps to trace infections. But use has mushroomed across China, where the government keeps a close eye on the population and collects troves of personal data. Many Chinese people say they are happy to cooperate for the greater good. They say that because if they don't say that, they get in trouble. We are in a special context with this epidemic, so divulging my movements doesn't bother me says Deborah Liu, a 30-year-old Shanghai resident. Now, you might be asking, Adam, you are covering all of these really great big-picture economic stories. Why the sudden shift to this texture of the global police state under the coronaphobia crisis? Green light, red light. That's what we should really be calling this bifurcation of the economy. Those who embrace peace, and cooperation and nonviolence versus those who want to prop up the failing red market system of economics designed to rip you off so the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The bifurcation of the economy is really the birth of a new world, a new economy based on these values of peace, love, and respect for individual rights.